Hi, Sarah. Welcome to Ghost Stories by the Fire. Hi. Thank you. Glad to be here. I'm so, yeah, I'm so excited to talk to you. So I'm very curious. Did you grow up with a family or in a household um, of people that believed in ghosts and spirits? And did you have a tradition of telling ghost stories with each other? So no, but in a way, yes, because uh, very staunchly Roman Catholic. So there was like reading the Bible at the table at dinner sometimes and, you know, Jesus rose from the dead and like Lazarus was kind of a zombie, you know, so there were those stories, but there was no, like anything else would have been considered, um, heathen. Oh, wow. So they were so strict Roman Catholic. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they were Jesuits, so they understood evolution was real, but yeah. Interesting. And so when you were a little kid, what scared you the most? I think I was afraid of, I was afraid of vampires. Um, and I was afraid, yeah, like, I think, I think the thing about religion, especially like when there's magic in your religion is like, you believe in magic, even if, even if it's not part of the, the belief system of that specific religion. So I was sure that, you know, anything could happen. Oh, oh yeah. So the nuns told us you could be possessed. So I remember reading The Exorcist when I was in sixth grade and see and watching it. And like, that's a crazy movie. And asking my parents and they were like, well, we didn't want to make you like a non-believer. So yeah, we told you it was real. And my nuns, because like, I went to Catholic school, they said it was real. My religious education teacher said it was real. And I was like, I think they're all punking me, but maybe it's real and it could happen any time. And because like what they said at the time is like, was it a true story? It was a boy who happened in Canada. The names have been changed. Oh, legit. That's what they told kids. And that, um, yeah, the perversity of Satan is that Satan would go after anyone, anytime, possess you. So, so they were literally using the exorcist as a teaching tool. No, like I wouldn't have found this stuff. Like everybody else was like, I don't know what the hell she's talking about. Like, I just like Christmas. And I was like, <laughs> wait. <laughs> oh my god. I heard about this thing. <laughs> I have a question. And like that they'd be like, we can't say no, you know? And I was like, now I was like, maybe they're all liars and there is no God. So would you have, would you like lie awake at night? And, and cause I used to, I shared a bedroom with my sister and I, and I was in the top bunk and I would always like, like scare myself by peeking down at her, wondering if her eyes would open and glow red. Like if she would become possessed, like what would I do? Did you ever, were, were you more afraid that you were going to get possessed or that someone in your family might be possessed? I think my best friend, Mary Beth, and I used to play that we were possessed sometimes. And it was like super fun. And like, but I was more afraid I would be possessed because then you don't know, right? It's like you're missing time. Did you ever read the book Sybil? I remember reading that in eighth grade and I was so freaked out because, yeah, and you would never know. You'd like, you'd think that you were a normal person, but really you had 18 personalities. <laughs> and maybe, maybe, and maybe we do. <laughs> we'll never know. I, I always think about that, like at the, at the end of your life, right? What if it's, oh, it's all been a joke or it's all been a dream or like you've just been living. Who You would never, ever, ever know. But wait a minute. So you and your friend, like other kids were playing Charlie's Angels and like. We also played Charlie's Angels. It was just one of them in the rotation, you know? <laughs> rotation. I love how, like, in a way, though, like, speaking of magic, you're literally, oh, that, I mean, talk about, like, they they tell, you know, kids or people, don't play with Ouija boards. You're opening up, you know, um, a, a, a space where you can converse with spirits or whatever. But I've just never heard of anybody playing exorcism. 
Oh, yeah. Well, so when you were at slumber parties and the crack an egg on your shoulder or squeeze an orange on your shoulder, crack an egg on your head, it was all the same stuff. Why do you think why do you think teenagers love to do that stuff? Because I haven't I mean, I'll stay up and, and read tarot cards all night long with my friends and, and we'll definitely like do spirit boards and stuff. But but those are my tarot friends, right? They're not like my regular girlfriends. And I, I remember just loving that stuff when I was a teenager. Um, why do you think that is? I think it's a time of questioning and self-definition. And I think the biggest question is like, do we exist? Why are we here? When we die, is there an afterlife? Like those are the real questions, you know, and, and they're the universal ones. And I think when you're younger, you sort of believe what you're told, if you're told anything. And then when you hit adolescence, you're like, this story I heard about, you know, God welcoming me with open arms and we're all the same person. We're unchanged, except we're unified with God. That's a Catholic thing. Seems crazy. And, um, you know, I, th I think a lot of, of kids are trying to figure out what that is, what the real thing is. And it's like, I wouldn't even call it a form of rebellion. I just call it curiosity. Yeah. And I think the, the fun thing is too, I mean, just thinking about being a teenager and, and doing like Ouija boards, light as a feather, stiff as a board, all of that stuff. It, to me, the space around those evenings feels so highly charged in a very unique way. Do you know, like, like anything could happen. And I think in a way it's like watching horror movies or like reading horror books, you know, and, and I think it's interesting because there's a connection to sacred space and, and, and ritualistic religions, which is to, to create a space vis-a-vis -vis candles and incense and architecture, music, so that people walk in kind of on heightened alert and are ready to, I don't know, receive something, a teaching or a learning. Did you attend church regularly as a kid? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I did until um, I think seventh or eighth grade. And um, it just wasn't for me. I thought it was, I, you know... I, I it it ceased to make sense to me, though I appreciate it. Like I respect other people's uh, organized religion. It just like ceased to make sense for me. And were you um, fascinated by the end of days? <sighs> so I thought it was all nonsense. Like honestly, and <laughs> like. I pretty quickly went from like interested in the occult to like, it's all bullshit. So I really felt like it was just a tool used to control people. So have you ever lived in a haunted house? The house my husband and I bought in Brooklyn when we bought it, um, like we went to look at it on a tour, you know, those, those like whatever, the open houses and there were these white sheets, like stapled really hard, like in these different parts of the house, like against walls. And, and it would be like stuff was coming out um, and, and it was all tucked under these sheets. And they told me not to touch the sheets. And I looked under the sheets and it was every floor. It was all four floors. Um, and under the sheets were altars. And... Um, yeah, and we bought it anyway, and it was like it was a really cheap house, so we bought it. And <laughs> and at the time, and the reason was like it was, it was, it was, it was a mess. And um, my husband had to leave town the day after we signed for the house, so I got the keys and went in. And um, there were bloody fingerprints on the ceiling of the basement, and where those altars had been. We're now just like um, like the carbon, you know, the burnt carbon, black stuff from from fires, you know, that they whatever offerings they'd had on altars on every floor. And I cleaned that off and I was like, I don't know, it seems fine. And my next door neighbor was like, so that was a church. And I was like, tell me more. And, <laughs> and he was like, um, <laughs> and he was like. I was like, like Santa Maria. And he was like, no, so much weirder than Santa Maria. It was a dark church. 
and like a bus of people in white robes used to come in and they would go to the basement and they would kill a chicken. And then they would come out with all like bloody necks, but having changed clothes. So they'd all gotten their whole bodies bloody with the chickens in the basement. Like, this is a crazy story. Did you know I was going to answer the story this way? I don't remember if I told you this. And so I was like, holy crap. I'm so freaked out. And then I realized like in the backyard, there was like someone had written in the concrete, like, what did it say? Mad man, mad something. It was just, a, and there was like a pentagram and like, <laughs> that was really crazy. And like, I was like, yeah, I'm kind of the perfect person for that. Cause I'm so arrogant. I'm like, yeah, there's nothing here. And like, <laughs> You know, like that's the story you want to write is the person who's just like, you know, they're literally being haunted and just can't, won't believe it. So, so yeah, I mean, all that was happening. And my writing group at the time, like I was like, I'm kind of lonely. I'm in the middle of nowhere because I'd moved from like downtown Brooklyn to Crown Heights. And like this was before people lived in Crown Heights. And so they all came out. This woman, Rhody Hawk and Dan Brown bought brought sage they're both horror writers and we're like just burn some sage so i was like okay and then my husband was like get yourself the rabbit you've always wanted and then you won't be lonely so i got a rabbit and nothing bad ever happened in that house where were you more afraid to find to see to, to like turn and see a vampire at your window like salem's lot like like scratching to get in or like vampires like under your bed and in the closet like what were your vampire fears Oh, I think, I think under the bed and in the closet, like I, it wouldn't have occurred to me, you know, cause you'd hear them coming in the window. Right. I like, I was like, they're not going to trance me. Like <laughs> <laughs> I'm not letting them in. <laughs> oh my God. I love it. But like those shapes when you'd wake up, you'd be like, what is that in the corner? What's coming for me? Oh, Salem's Lot scared me so much. It was this, the, uh, it was the window. And I stay up until like, I don't know, up until not too long ago, I was still really, do, are, you, are you ridiculously afraid of anything like right now, like in your present life? I think sometimes at night when I go to sleep, especially if my husband's away, they're like in the next room. Like, I'm afraid someone will come in for the kids and I'll sleep through it. That's, and that's, that's a legit real fear. And at the, at the live ghost stories by the fire, so many people that get up and share stories are about like warrior moms, like taking on peeping toms or like knowing something was going on when nobody else believed the mom or like, there's just so many like badass mom stories that get shared. Um, there's nothing more. I think it's, it is a particularly harrowing experience when you're alone in a house with the kids or with your ch child or children. Yeah. No, one time, um, I came down the stairs in Brooklyn and a guy had gotten in the house and was going through the mail on the table, which I don't know. I think he was crazy more than a robber, but he wouldn't get out. He was like, can I talk to someone about a job? not you lady. I'm not leaving. And, um, I charged him <laughs> Get out of my house. and like, cause it's like my kids toys were everywhere. And I was just like, you're in, you're in the zone. This isn't happening. And I, I just charged him and he and ran him out and then was screaming on the stoop. And like my neighbors all came out and they thought maybe they need to help me. And then they were like, oh, we don't need to help her. <laughs> and they were like laughing. <gasps> How long did it take you? How long did it take you to go? I, that's one of those, the, oh my God. That's one of those things I think so many people imagine. You never know how you're going to react. Well, I mean, I was like, I as soon as I saw him, I was like, no, you're not supposed to be here. And um I was like, what do you, you know, as soon as he wasn't answering the questions, he was just standing his ground. I was like, this isn't going, like, this isn't going to be a conversation. I'm just coming at you like a nut, like a nut, you know? And he was like, whoa, okay, I'm out. So have you ever 
Have you ever had contact with a ghost or with someone who's passed over to the other side? My dad died almost six months ago, like six months and two days ago. And uh, he was painting when he, like, as he found out he had his diagnosis, one of the series of paintings he was working on was like an ocean against rocks. And they were beautiful. And, and when he died, I took the majority of his paintings back to Los Angeles. And there's one that's hanging in our dining room that's like you know, this ocean and these large rocks. So uh, my family and I went on a trip to um, Eureka, California. Um, it's, it's Northern California. And then I forget the name of the town, but there's an oceanside town that's a little further north of that. We were staying there and it's beautiful. It's like, um, I'd say it's as pretty as Maine, like, like coastal Maine, it's really beautiful. And, um, but the weather's rough and uh, cold. And so we were at a sandbar, we walked to the ocean and we were among these rocks. And I would say that the water coming in, because it was a sandbar, would have been like two to three inches deep, right? That's how deep it was. And I was with the girls. My husband was walking around. And then the friend, um, the other dad we were traveling with, was, was with me and the girls between these rocks. And we were sort of talking. I don't remember exactly. And then suddenly water filled up. Like, I was like, whoa, you guys, you guys. And I was wearing like a vest. It was cold out. The girls were there, you know, and and the water was over our heads between these rocks. And like, I was walking toward them to like herd them, you know, back. And uh, it shook us like a washing machine. And um, I mean, it's scary to even talk about. Uh, so my older one, she's 14 you know, I found out later was holding on to my little one, my 12 year old, but couldn't keep holding on and let go. And uh, so we were all underwater and um, and I got up, you know, when it was over and I looked, I saw my older one and I said, you know, where's Francis? And we, we didn't know. And uh, we turned around and then that dad was a little further out and had grabbed her and they were standing there and you know, there's so many ways I could tell myself it was no big deal. Nothing bad was really going to happen. But I really think that was, um, I, I feel that he saved her life. Um, and, uh, you know, these rocks, it was just carrying everything right back out to sea. And her head was headed toward the rocks when he got her. Um, and uh, we were just shocked. We were all just shell shocked. Like we just, and everyone was exhausted. It was like this, like just this crazy, crazy amount of adrenaline had run through all of us. Nuts. You know, like uh, we all had to take naps. Like we walked back and just exhausted. And um, that night I dreamed I saw him, my father. And he was, but only his back. And it was just sad. I was super sad. And he said, um, I'll always be with you. And in my dream, I was like, good, you're not dead. You can like be my dad. And, and then, but then he kept walking and I was like, no, he's dead, but he's saying he'll always be with me. And then in the morning or we got back and we looked at that painting and that painting looks exactly like we were where we were standing, uh, when it happened. Um, exactly. You know, the, the two rocks and they're really big and there's water rushing in. Um, and he did a three series painting of that. You know, there's a thousand ways I could tell myself it's a coincidence and maybe it is, but the feeling I had was wonderful when we put that together and it felt everything about it felt like the most incredible luck, you know, um, it was not like, you know, sometimes you think, oh, I overreacted. It was, this was really mortally dangerous. I don't know how we got ourselves in that situation. Like it was shocking. It went from like two inches to way over our heads, to just like flinging us around. Wow. Thank you for sharing. That's terrifying. I mean, I, I just, the ocean story, it's terrifying. It's, 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 
equally terrifying and touching. That that's literally one of the ocean is something that that, that terrifies. I mean, first I know so I, I just that I just can't imagine. I just can't imagine. I mean, it was I the other dad, his face, all of us, we just were so shocked. You know, it was like we'd thought this was nothing. And then suddenly it was one of the most dangerous things that could have happened. The most dangerous thing that could have happened. Do any of the things that you write ever up coming true? Have you ever written about an imaginary place and then found yourself there? Or I don't know, has anything ever come through for you that way? Um, you know, I wrote about a sinkhole in Good Neighbors and then uh, a, on a cul-de-sac and then a sinkhole did appear on our cul-de-sac, you know, the bottom of our hill in Los Angeles. Yeah. <laughs> how much, how much time elapsed between? <laughs> I think I sold the book, like, it was like six months after I sold the book, something like that, maybe a year before the book came out. It was a call. It, that was, yeah. But I think often like I'm working through things and I think the mind, um, the subconscious is smarter than the conscience, conscience in a lot of ways. And so I think a lot of the time is, those things really do come true. However, um, it's because you were working toward them in your work to a discovery, but I, I wasn't working toward a sinkhole. <laughs> <laughs> Yet there it was. <laughs> do you do you ever like freak yourself out when you're writing and like I don't know and and like a story or a thing like you know how um things will pop into your mind like do you ever scare yourself? <sighs> yeah, I mean, I say I like I kind of my memory of previous work is, is, is dim. You know, I've written some really, um, horrific stories, but I don't really remember the experience of them anymore. It's been so long ago. So I can speak to the last two books and with good neighbors, I kind of was frightened of my, my anti-hero a little bit. And I think, um, I think the revelations of who she was and I think the revelations of like uh, what middle age was were kind of scary to me, which is that, you know, you sort of have these ideas of who you are and how everything should be. And those ideas can sometimes um, create damage in themselves and they can make you a worse person in a way that feels monstrous and shocking. You know, I think, you know, whenever you go, wait a minute, I was the villain. It's a terrible feeling. It really is. But like denying that you just, you know, you really are going to hell if, if you're, if you deny that because there's no coming back from, from lying about it. So you have to go, well, I guess, I guess I was bad. I guess I was wrong. And that, I hate that feeling. It's the worst. It's like so bad. It's uh, one, of, one of the big things that I that I do. My Darkwood Tarot is all about shadow work, right? So I, it's kind of I always find it horrifying when when you kind of cop to maybe like how much of a dick you are, or how wrong you've been, or how cool you've been, or how like god awful you've been. But then I find this incredible freedom once I get over that like really uncomfortable hump, and I, and I feel like ah, oh. so it's not so bad. Everybody's kind of a dick sometimes, you know, oh, we're all, and like, we're, yeah. yeah, and it can be funny and it can be, it can be something you could even laugh about and it doesn't make you a bad person. But I think that's, I think you have to get through a real level of maturity to come to that place where like being a jerk, being, doing wrong things doesn't make you bad. It just makes you human just makes you human. But to your earlier point about being possessed, right, is is that idea that our, our own blind spots, not realizing how atrocious we can be or watching someone else, like your anti-hero, who, you know, someone who doesn't 
realize how much of a monster they are. Yes, I think that's I think that's a fear. I think that's probably my biggest fear is this, this lack of self-awareness. I'm sure I know there's tons of blind spots and it's like and it's very disconcerting. Do you would you say that you have a very active dream life? Yes. And has anything crazy ever but other than like what's some of the craziest things that have happened in your so I have recurring dreams and recurring characters in my dreams. It's like, I'm like, who will I see tonight? Um, so uh, there's a couple. When I was a kid, I dreamed I was on an island and uh, there were monsters off the island, you know, in the ocean. But in order to get out, off the island, I had to figure out how to get through the monsters and like, I learned to befriend the monsters and then I liked the island. Um, and then, uh, so when I was in my twenties, I wound up being, um, I was really sick. Like I had some kind of autoimmune thing, but I think it was from toxic exposure and, um, I was sick for a couple of years. And I couldn't, like, I was trying to keep my life together at the same time. And, but like, I, it was, you know, it was the, infl I had like horrible inflammation of my entire respiratory tract. It was very painful. And, um, I was still trying to like, like keep my apartment going, keep my job going, keep my this and all this stuff. And it just was so hard. And I didn't know how to make it work. And I just didn't know, like, I just felt completely done, undone. And I just was like, how? And um, I couldn't figure out answers externally. Like, I think it was a little too much. You know, no one knew how, what to do. And I remember I had this dream where this woman, I was sitting in a lawyer's office and this woman was dressed impeccably and very put together and like 10 years older than me and was like, everything's going to turn out fine. You're going to be okay. You just have to concentrate on taking care of your health and getting your writing done. And that's it. And just let everything else go. And I was like, you're, sh you're sure. And she was like, I have this for you. I'm taking care of everything else. And I was like, okay. And then it was her. She was me. She was, I looked at her and I was like, this is me in 10 years. This is me. I'm looking at me. And she was like, and it's okay. And so she, she has come to me in dreams a few times. Oh, wow. So at this point, do you recognize her when she shows up? Are you like, oh, hi. Or does she kind of surprise you in she different She surprises guises? me every time. <laughs> but it was the, probably the best dream I've ever had because I woke up and was like, it's okay. You know, and it will be okay. And like, I'm going to live, you know, cause I was a little worried about that. And, uh, so, and it was. That is so cool. Oh, that is, that's incredible. Well, do you have anything else spooky or creepy that, that, uh, yeah. The story is that um, it was the summer before uh, I left for college and I was sleeping and I woke up and, um, you know, you look into the your room and it's dark and like a shape emerged from the far side of the bed, like the other side of the room. And it was a box, it looked like a tissue box and it's floated closer and closer to me. And um, its head was like a demonic head. You know, it was like this terrible. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah. Yeah. So it was like this, it was like a jack in the box head, only it was like staring and angry. And it was like coming at me and I was paralyzed. I was like, oh my God. And it may have been, an, it wasn't a night terror. It might've been something, you know, like some switch flipped. It's going to happen and like sort of like, especially in those adolescent years, like your neurology where you sort of the dream comes into your waking life. So but whatever it was, it came at me 
And I was like, God damn it. And I just started swiping at it <laughs> until it receded. It didn't go away. It just receded back where it had been. And I was like, I'm out. And like, I left the room and I stayed in the bathroom for like an hour. And then I went down and waited till like dawn. And then I was like, dad, this thing happened. And he was like, he just looked at me like, okay. And I was like, mom, this terrible thing happened. And she was like, and it took me like a couple days before I would sleep in that bedroom again. I don't blame you. Yeah. I don't think I would ever go back. How, how old were you? I was 17. Uh, 17? You're not like, not even like a little kid. Like No, I remember this well. Like, and like. What do you think it was? You know, at the time. You know, I can only say what I thought it was at the time. And the time I thought it was real. I thought it was something coming for me. And it didn't want good things for me. Like, <laughs> like it was coming. So. <laughs> but and it was very me. It's so great. But that bears the question, right? If something and wants to do you harm, why would it wait until you were looking? Right. If you had been like asleep, like why, you know, like it's but here's so the question. Maybe it's been doing harm all this time and now it's finally coming out. Right? Oh. Yes. Like out of your body, like energetically, like it's leaving you. <gasps> Do you believe that energy can kind of attach itself to a person? Probably. Probably. I mean, I I, I don't know. <sighs> So can you will things and they affect other people? I don't know, but I think you can will things and they affect yourself on a, a conscious or a subconscious level. Yes. But then again, I also think that I, I think energy is a real thing. And I think mm -hmm. that it has effects. And I think thoughts, collective thoughts may have real tangible results. Definitely. I would, I would definitely agree with you on that. Have you ever practiced witchcraft? No, because I think it's insane, but. <laughs> wait, why wait? Back that up. Why do you think witchcraft is insane? No, I actually like, I don't know. Um, I think, uh, I don't know that it would make much difference. I think it's probably the same as like meditation or it's the same as, you know, uh, targeted thought or prayer. You know, I don't know. I think it's probably fun. I, you know, I'm writing so much all the time that I think, you know, maybe that's my witchcraft. Yeah, I would, I would agree. <laughs> I would agree with that. I, I, and I think it's interesting, you know, and your, your, your new book, A Better World, which takes place in the not so distant future, right? What I, what I think is interesting, um, I'd heard somebody say that, maybe it was Carl Jung, if you pay attention to what artists and writers are, you know, they pick up on what's happening before it's manifested out in the world, right? Like certainly when we're looking at the future, we're wondering, oh my God, what what could it be like? But it feels to me like if, I don't know, it's almost like when, when zombies became like a huge thing, right? And zombies were everywhere, movies, TV, and like it was like people couldn't get enough. Like we kind of knew, I think everybody kind of, or not everybody, but you have an idea that something's coming. Right. And sure enough, it did. And it has, you know, unfolded vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the pandemic um, and certainly seemingly being like teetering bits of chaos due to social media and and um, and all of that stuff. So so I, I think one of the interesting things about witchcraft and about writing is oftentimes uh, with witchcraft or shamanic work, if the practitioner is moving into a space where they're looking at the energy of something before it's manifest in the world. Um, I think that's exactly what an artist or a writer does is, is because that's the space that you're, you're taking something 
that is not here yet and bringing it into actual physical existence. I, I agree with you on that. And I think that um, it's the same way with when you're an individual person and you say the worst version of something, you know, and you decide to believe the worst version of something. You're creating that, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's power to thoughts and words in that way too. And I don't know, I think um, there's Radbury's story, The Toynbee Conductor, about, um, it's a short story, and it's about how the world became a better place because everyone heard about the Toynbee Conductor. If I'm remembering this right, I'm remembering the theme better than the facts. Mm -hmm. um, and like the world was in a terrible place, but then they heard about this discovery, this time machine that told them that this thing was going to happen. The world was going to be OK. And then so everything was OK. And then the time comes when this discovery was supposed to happen. And the guy's like, I made it up because the world needed hope, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, yeah, I think uh, you can create reality because of the stories you tell. And you can also pick up on reality and me telling them sooner too. I, I think those, both those things are true. Do you ever feel like when you're, when you're working, you're, you're rubbing up against uh, energies or entities or I'm not talking necessarily about when an idea pops into your head that you're like, Oh, I don't know what, but do you ever feel like, um, I don't know, in doing research or, or, or in the writing itself, do you ever have moments where you feel like you're bumping up against something distinct and separate from you in energy or consciousness? I think I probably have. Uh, when I worked on The Keeper, there's a chapter that felt um, like I was in communication with something. And then uh, with a better world, um, like I have this idea and I, there's certain things that you don't want to say out loud because they're too awful. Um, but uh, it seems to me that there will be the detonation of a nuclear weapon at some point. And so in a better world, I say that there is, you know, this is, this is, it's happened in the world. It's, it's happened in the Middle East and like superstitiously, I called it the place Babylon, like in the last Babylon. Um, and as I was going over copy edits, I was like, I, I felt like I was like, I just didn't know if it was wrong to do it. Like maybe the coming up against the entity of myself of like, is it wrong? Was what I was doing wrong to even say this was going to happen? Which I like, I know is maybe me being a little too overly, scrupulous because people write about the stuff all the time but for me it bothered me and um and i also thought like but calling it babylon is bs you know i need to actually name the place i need to just go ahead and do it and say like this is you know this is an altered lit world where this happens and so i did um and it feels uh strange mm. um and it feels uh, scary. Um, and I don't like it, but I also felt like, uh, it also felt true. Um, so I did it. Yeah. Well, and, and to that point, right. Writing something based on a possible future, um, with everything that we're all, that people are all frightened about or nervous about. Yeah, you you would have to probably have something at that that level, right? To, yeah, that's so interesting. Well, I mean, so. I, I, like, I don't know why I worry about it so much when you see all these books on the shelves that are like, and then everyone was eating each other and the world died and they blew up the trade center again. <laughs> and it's like, terrible, so I'm saying these things. Have some respect, but people love it. So I want to that that new movie with um with Julia Roberts and Ethan Hawke about it's like a, a dystopian, right? I um, read the book, people. but I haven't seen the movie. 
Oh, you haven't? So, you know, and I don't think there's any spoilers here for if anybody hasn't watched it, but I was like, really? Like, you're going to blow up New York City again? Like, how many times do we have to see the skyline of New York? I just hate that. Them? Stop Leave it. New York alone. New, New York is better than L.A. You L.A. people, stop with your stupid loser stories. And I live in L.A. And I can say that. Like, pick on your own stupid city. Seriously. Seriously. You should I don't watch. remember that watch. happening in the book. They were probably looking for something to do, too. Because I, I don't remember that being a part of the book. The book was like, it was mysterious. The mystery was mysterious still. Wait, it's it's still a mysterious mystery 30 pages later. The end. Oh, well, that sounds like I, I don't, you, you, you should take a while. It does an interesting New York uh, geography. Um, this, that movie, I, I would highly advise like watching it. If, if it's like when it's one of those things where they're like, yeah, we're, we're too, we're just an hour from the city, but they're in this like nondescript Long Island, like trying to like my, and, my, and my husband, who's from Long Island, he's like, no, they're on the bay side. I'm like, no, they're on the Atlantic. And then they go into the backyard and see the full skyline. <laughs> like, none of it makes any sense whatsoever. Is this Locust Valley? <laughs> Could be. Could be. So I have to ask, um, Based on just your experience as a human, and I always these this is my, these are my this is my last question for Ghost Stories by the Fire, but it's my favorite, my favorite questions questions. Um, and there's no right or wrong. Where, just in your estimation and in your feeling, where do you think you were before you were born, and what do you think will happen after you pass? You tell me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> With my husband is like, no, it freaks me out. The whole thing freaks me out. I'm like, and um, my, my husband is like, it's kind of great though, because think about how long, for how long you didn't exist and it didn't bother you. <laughs> <laughs> like a really good sleep. You were like sleeping all of that time brilliantly. <laughs> But I get to dream for chance. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I have no idea. I have no idea. I think that's the great mystery. But I, I, I think something. I don't think nothing. I don't think oblivion. So it's kind of the great hereafter. I don't know. Uh, I will. I will say, since you did ask me what I think. And I and I and and this is something that again it, it brings me great peace and great I I just love it so I'm the super skeptic and I feel like I, I don't want to just believe like obviously just believe I want, when something's actually happening I want to know it's happening right and so I had never been someone who's ever actually seen a ghost uh, it's just no matter how much I wanted it to happen it's never ever happened my husband and I were trying to get pregnant. Um, and it had only been like a month or so. And I was painting a bedroom in my loft and just like, I was in that flow state, I think kind of like absentmindedly, just like with the paint roller. And I swear on every member of my family's life, three beings showed up like in the corner of that room and the one in the middle without saying it because it wasn't like I heard words, but the one in the middle picked me. And then took off. And I went, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna be pregnant. Like I've been picked, like they picked me. And sure enough, like I was. <laughs> and we had only, we had only just started. I wasn't like, you know what I mean? Like, and, and I, it it just brings that, and I it just I don't know. It brings, and I'm like, well, then there was definitely a before, and there's definitely an after, and who knows what it's going to be like. But I just, uh, I just thought that was lovely. That's great. I love that. Yeah, there's something really cool about kids. You know, there's something like 
they open your eyes to a lot of things. <gasps> Wait a minute. Were your kids ever spooky when they were like two and three, like talking to ghosts at the window or? Yep. Would you, were you, were you like, what are you looking at, little Amelia? Tell mommy. <laughs> well, like, were you encouraging it? I, like, I would have if it were like a stranger, but I, like, <laughs> and not a child, because I'm so like, I'm just, I'm always like drilling people for what they're thinking. But no, my own, I, I'd just be like, let's go back to bed and just like lead them back to bed. But um, yeah, yeah. And they, um, one of them, she had, I think, I think she had something. Uh, I did some research online because she had night terrors, but the night terrors were scary because um, they would alarm me. And then I would try and like, be like, Hey, what's wrong? What's wrong? And, and they couldn't, the, the switch was flipped where they were in dream, but hearing me, but awake, but asleep and couldn't put it all together. So it was very scary for her. And so like, I learned that what I had to do was to just be like really calm and not even actually speak and sort of just lead her. She couldn't understand words, but I looked it up and uh, night terrors happen to a certain amount of kids. Um, and uh, it's because something isn't developed in their brain yet. And they also might uh, wet the bed. They, they might also be bedwetters for the same reason, because like that waking and sleeping. And if you don't let them wear socks or footy pajamas. And so I banned socks and footy pajamas from our house and it stopped. Oh, my goodness. Wait, what's the connection between the footed pajama and they and the can't brain? regulate temperature? in their sleep because there's some gland, right? That takes care of that for you, but it's not developed yet in them. And so they're not regulating their temperature and they get overheated and then something happens. That is fascinating. And really, that's really good to know. I, I, my daughter had one night terror once and that's so funny. She was where I can, I remember going in and seeing, and she was in her crib in footy pajamas but like was like awake, but asleep and screaming and looking past. Oh, it was, ter it was harrowing. Oh. oh, it's so upsetting. I remember just being like, because uh, your kid's so upset and you don't know how to calm them. Yeah. It's this freaking footy pajamas. <laughs> oh my God. Sarah. <laughs> Thank you so much <laughs> for joining us today at Ghost Stories by the Fire. We have learned, get your toddlers out of the footy pajamas <laughs> if you never want to have to experience that. Be careful when you, you're walking on the beach. And um, wow, a lot of great stuff here today. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I loved, loved talking to you. Thank you so much for being part of Ghost Stories by the Fire. Do you have a spooky story, near-death experience, or supernatural happening you'd like to share? I'd love to hear it. Submit your story to sashagram.com with Ghost Stories by the Fire in the subject line. You might just wind up on this podcast. And if you want to support it and keep the ghost stories coming, head on over to sashagram.com to check out my books and tarot decks, which are available for purchase at your favorite bookseller. The Ghost Stories by the Fire theme song is titled Lovely from the original motion picture score of The Deeper You Dig, a film about the lengths a mother will go to to find her daughter's killer. Thanks again for listening, and until next time, I'm saving you a seat at the fire.